Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to Quadriga coming to you from the heart of the German capital Berlin. And this week we're talking about how divided Germany still is a quarter of a century after reunification. This after celebrations to mark the latest anniversary of the unification of East and West were badly marred. Merkel out, Merkel out, chanted hundreds of far-right protesters in Dresden. The Chancellor had come to the city in the eastern state of Saxony to mark the 26th anniversary of the coming together of East and West. She said it was a day of joy and gratitude, but no doubt about it, the mood in Dresden was toxic. So the question we're asking today here on Quadriga is this. East and West, how united is Germany? And to discuss that question, I'm joined here in the studio by three seasoned commentators and analysts, beginning with the author and academic Johannes Stemmler, who says Germany is united, but only on the surface. Also joining us is Andreas Klutz, the Germany correspondent of The Economist magazine. East and West are, he believes, slowly growing together economically, but they're growing even further apart in their psychopolitical cultures. And a warm welcome to Anna Zauerbrei from the Berlin Daily Der Tagesspiegel, who also writes for the International New York Times. She says, we had almost forgotten, but recent attacks and abuse have brought back the ugly East. Well, Johannes Stemmler, let me begin with you, because you were born in Dresden, the city in Saxony that has been uh, at the focus of a lot of attention this last week. People have been talking about the troubling events there. What do you make of it all? Well, to be honest, it really hurts to see the pictures from Dresden. Um, intellectually, I don't find it so hard to understand that people are aggravated, that they need some way of articulating their... Um, their disbelief, but emotionally, I find it really hard to see it happening in Dresden, to see it happening this way, and to have um, a feeling that there's not much communication actually going on. There's no discussion. It's a, it's a loud scream. When you say you're hurt, can you describe that hurt for us? Well, being born in Dresden, being born in any place, you, most of the people have some attachment to where they come from. Mm. And Dresden is really a pretty city. It has an, it's really made a comeback after 89, 90. It's beautiful. It, it draws a lot of attention, visitors, high culture. But then there seems to be a considerable part of the people that do not take part in it, that don't, that don't care about the picture of the city. Mm. They just see they're left behind or not talk to, and that's why they... Um, use the scene they got on Monday. Yeah, and when we talk about those scenes, Anna Zauerbrei, uh, one of the one German politician, a Green politician, Claudia Roach, is quite well known, who was in the thick of it in Dresden. She said afterwards that she was confronted with organised, brutal, and unrestrained hatred. How concerned are you? Of course, I am concerned um, because uh, it's not just people expressing their rage in the streets, but we also see the rage entering the political system mm -hmm. in its organized form, the Alternative for Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany, um, in many of the Eastern parliaments that have voted. Um, and of course, that is a reason to be concerned about, but um, I also think that it's not too late to pick up the conversation with those people and to keep trying. And I think it was right that Claudia Roth tried to talk to the people, though she didn't succeed, of course. Mm -hmm. Andreas Klute, until recently, German reunification was viewed as one of the sort of the great success stories of recent decades anywhere in the world. Something's gone wrong, though. It has, and especially in the narrative that the people in the East tell themselves about what's happened in the last 26 years. Uh, what I find interesting is that, for instance, I went recently went to Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, a state that had an election and a state that has 8% unemployment, which is a little bit higher than in the whole of Germany mm -hmm. and a lot lower than in the rest of Europe and a lot lower than what that state has had since unification. So objectively, they're doing very well. There are very few foreigners there, by the way, and extremely few uh, refugees. And yet they have a narrative that, they've, that they're the losers of reunification, that for 26 years they got shafted, that it was not a merger, reunification was not a merger, but a takeover by the West. And so I think that, that 
they fit into that theme that we see from Trump to Brexit, even to Australia, the whole West, mm -hmm. of an alienation. Mm -hmm. And I think the refugees play into that. Again, there are very few refugees. I didn't meet any when I was there in Schwerin. But they, they just feel that they're losers. They're angry at the political correctness that they perceive you and me, for instance, and us here mm -hmm. to be d um, dabbling in. Mm -hmm. And they're just fed up. And that's, that's, about the, that's the psychology of it. You're nodding, Anna. Um, I agree. Um, I think um, it is not only part, I mean, probably the motives are mixed. We have um, the, the economic deprivation that really does exist. So many people have um, improved their lives. Uh, the, the poverty has lowered uh, and we see less of the exodus of the young people that happened um, after the wall came down. Um, so there are many points um, of improvement, but we also still see the significant economic differences. So that is one motive, I think. Um, and then, of course, the refugee crisis has brought up all the emotions that were maybe stored away for a couple of years or um, for at least five or six years where we have seen those improvements and brought it back to life. And then, of course, we have the third layer. I totally agree with you there um, that global populist movement that makes people feel that even though they're a minority, um, they are allowed to set the tone. Mm -hmm. And if the government doesn't do what they want individually, um, the government has to, um, well, be... Uh, dismantled or um, toppled over and that's how the cry Merkel has to go, uh, Merkel Weck uh, comes into life. Yeah, Johannes, talking about victimhood on the one side, talking about Angela Merkel and Merkel has to go on the other side. It's, it's interesting for international uh, viewers, I'm sure, l looking on at what's happening, that people in the East tend to say that they've been left behind, that they've been shut out by development since reunification. But when you look at the two top jobs in German politics, the German president, Mr Galk, and, uh, and Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, they're both people from the East and they're both despised by other people from the East. What on earth is going on? Well... It's about, it's the two of them, and then there's a lot of uh, non, there's not much elite that comes from the East, to be honest. Okay, okay the president, okay, the chancellor. What more can you want? Mm -hmm. But looking into the military, into uh, big enterprises, into many, many um, socially relevant areas, you don't find East Germans in the top positions, mm -hmm. even after 25 years. But... What I find more frightening is that a very old uh, narrative comes to the surface. It's the construction of the us versus them. And constructing the us is easily done, especially when you feel left behind. Or whatever you feel, if you find an us, you just need a them. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in the GDR, the them, the others, mm -hmm. were the... the the elites, it was the political system. People could withdraw from the system by pointing at the others, they uh, running the country and running it badly. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're um, putting Gauck and Merkel on the other side. Mm -hmm. They don't relate to them because they belong to the other system. Mm -hmm. The same goes with the foreigners. It's someone else entering our system, challenging our we and... Um, it's a very basic, very simple structure, but it does not allow communication, does not allow debate. Um, it's very, very and solid. Very, very harsh language has been used. I was listening to some of the some of the expletives that were being, you know, were being thrown at the Chancellor. It was an unbelievably vulgar language. I was, I must admit, I was personally shocked, and I wondered whether I'm sort of getting old-fashioned or whether the the discourse has moved on. Andreas, you, you, I mean, I you was, talked about rage. I was shocked. I, I took, I've taken many trips. Uh, to the east, which is all around here in Berlin, where we happen to be. Uh, for instance, a, a year ago, I, I wrote a story on a part of Saxony where, at that time, there had been many riots against uh, refugee homes. And that was Sächsische Schweiz. It's called Saxony. Yeah. It's, it's a corner uh, near the Czech Republic and, and so forth. And I traveled around, and, and like you, I was shocked because I'm used to Western or multicultural Berlin and the way we are sensitized in our language just from habits and the way they're not. And it really seemed like an 
alien culture like a foreign country, even though I spoke, spoke flu fluent German with them and have a German name, it really was very different and I find it very shocking. But I have to tell you, in that too, they're not an exception. I think you'd find the same if you go to parts of northern England. Uh, where I come blue, from. Where you come from, so I'd, I'd like yeah. to hear that. And uh, if you go to Appalachia, there's part of, let's say, if you go to West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, Trump land, uh, you, you would find a very different and deliberately un-PC, unpolitically correct, raw language, which makes them feel authentic. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've listened, we've talked a little bit about Angela Merkel. Let's listen now to two other German politicians as they try to put the events of, uh, that, that we've been talking about in Dresden into perspective. First, we're going to listen to um, the government's commissioner for Eastern German Affairs. She's called Iris Gleicher. Uh, but before that, let's listen to Norbert Lammert speaking in Dresden. He's the, uh, the speaker of the German parliament, the president of the Bundestag. Und diejenigen, die heute besonders laut pfeifen, the people who are here today booing and shouting and otherwise expressing their outrage die haben offenkundig have obviously forgotten what shape this city and this country were in before reunification was achieved the situation in Eastern Germany is complicated, and these demonstrators are a minority. The vast majority of those who live in the eastern states are neither xenophobic nor right-wing extremists. But this majority has become a silent majority, and I would appeal to them to speak out. Yeah, two interesting comments there. Uh, Johannes Stemmler, first of all, we heard Norbert Lammert saying that uh, many people in Eastern Germany appear to have forgotten what their country was like before reunification, before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Is that an impression that you share? They haven't. Ah. And I think most of them do not want to go back to the GDR. I mean, looking at them, it's not old people. It's young people. What do people. they want? They're against everything that is, the, the, that is you know, out there today. Well, so it seems at times. I don't know what they want. It seems that they do not want to actually talk to someone. They just want to scream out their aggravation. And uh, I have a hard time to say it's all of East Germany. And um, as you say, you find these kind of people in, uh, in many parts of the world. Um, what I see, it's the political system, the, the political parties and civil society that needs to reach out in one form or the other. And this is nothing to be done in a week. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has not been tried sufficiently in the last 25 years. Looking at how German parties are organized, you'll find they're very uh, weak on the local level in East Germany. It's, maybe it's too strenuous, maybe it's too expensive. They're just not there. Speaking of political parties, I think one thing that, that is interesting to, to remind viewers abroad of is that a lot of East Germans, in fact, most East Germans, have n none of the traditional affiliation or, and practice with the political party system, which is West Germany's system that was brought in. Mm -hmm. uh, and because if you remember, even old East Germans, they went from one dictatorship to the second, and in 1990 suddenly got a democracy imported that w had already evolved. But you find very fluid and somewhat Weimar Republic-like conditions in that, for instance, another party very strong in the East, besides the alternative for Germany on the far right, is the left, which is the successor of the Communist Party of Germany that some of these people marched against. But it is now seen as essentially a regional, it's sort of, they stick up for us, as, as Johannes said, it's us against them. And it doesn't matter that they're communists and some of the people on the far right are notionally far apart. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of voter migration be between them mm -hmm. because they have never, they have not grown up with the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, and with the debates that West Germany had. They came in and they just felt this doesn't concern us and they're seeking some sort of uh, protection in, in a group, and it, that is the problem with the, they have no, the, the political parties are not, as you said, rooted there, and that is part of the problem. But it is I hard mean, to reach them. The question is how far it has to go. I mean, Anna, the, you know, we, we heard the German government's commissioner for Eastern German Affairs there saying it's time for people, the proud people of your city of Dresden, they're very proud people, they're proud of their city and they're proud of themselves, but when are they gonna stand up and be counted? Well, but 
I think it's a bit unfair to say they're not out on the streets either because there have been counter demonstrations against Pegida. There are a lot of uh, civil society movements, artists um, and teachers and also the local politicians who do exist. Um, they, they do go out and they protest the protest. Um, so I think there's maybe not they're maybe not loud enough, but it's hard to be that loud. Um, we've seen that on Monday. It's really hard to to come up with the same level of aggression. And um, of course, that's um, that's something that's sort of also medially playing in the favor of these movements who are really very small. And it has, we also, even though I said in the beginning, I am concerned about the, the turnout of the of the recent votes. But when you look at, at the long-term um, attitudes, political attitudes and how they evolved, there is not that much of a difference as is in the turnouts and the votes in those basic attitudes. For example, xenophobia, we have um, maybe 6%, depending on how you measure it in mm -hmm. the West and then you have a quite constant 10% um, in the East to harbor those um, attitudes, those xenophobic attitudes. Mm -hmm. And of course that is a significant difference, but it's it it looks bigger um, or it looked bigger on Monday and on the many Pegidia outings than, than the long-term development really shows. Johannes, tell us a little bit more about the proud people of Dresden and how they can respond here. Well, the proud is omnipresent. I haven't seen any other city where people constantly go into the same museums year after year, um, just being proud of where they are and who they are. Um, the last time they demonstrated big time all together was 1989. They didn't wear on the forefront with Leipzig. Mm. Um, maybe it's at the subtext of Dresden being a more administrative city, being used to some kind of king, <laughs> buying all this beautiful art <laughs> to be kind of flowing around the beauty uh, of being. Uh, I don't know what it would take to pull the people up on the street. It was always a bigger Pegida demonstration than a counter demonstration. Do you, do, when you go back to Dresden, do you have these conversations with people? Do you sit and say, what are we going to do? Are we going to say, we've got all this lovely art, people come to the city, we're very proud of our great Baroque traditions and so far and so forth, but the reputation of the city is being ruined? I know I've written on it and I'm really sad to say that even those, those people that are against Pegida, they say, well, let's just not report on it, let's not say anything, let's just wait, they go away as the Nazis, they went away, which they didn't. They just didn't go out on the street anymore. Uh, the momentum of I go out, I expose myself uh, with the opinion of I'm against you, or this is not my city. I do not want this picture to be broadcasted around the globe, mm -hmm. is a notion that is not, that the people don't have. Okay. They withdraw. <laughs> I've, I've encountered that too. I talked, uh, I found people on my trips to Saxony, there's a German word, Nestbeschmutzer, that, they've, that I heard often there. I think mm -hmm. we, we could say that they're, don't soil your own nest. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a funny thing. You can find liberal Saxons, for instance, mm -hmm. who are against Pegida. But as soon as we, and as I, as an outsider, come and say, so what are you doing? Or tell me about this. And I already know they're, they're active against it. They withdraw and says, "Well, I don't want to be. I don't want to soil my own nest." And as, as if they're, and I think that this they're rounding up the wagons very much against any outsider. And I feel that they're not interested in what's going on in the country, in Europe, in the world to understand the issues. If you're interested in solutions, you have to look at the Syrian civil war and much else. They're not interested in that. They want to maintain their identity, which mm -hmm. they think is under siege. Mm -hmm. but it I guess the idea that Pegida is going to go away again wasn't that wrong because for a while it looked like it was going to go away again by its own. And then 2015 happened, the refugees came in and the mood started to turn again, but mm -hmm. Pegida was almost dead like before the summer of 2015. So maybe we will see a bit of a decline again. But there's the always the something is broken. Every time something's happening in the city that is um, destroying a little bit of the Dresden picture, of the East German picture, um, of course all these movements go away at some point in time. 
but there's there's no debating culture um, after it. There's always the poo, we've gone through this, let's go back to daily business. Mm -hmm. And the rounding up the wagon effect is again the we against the us against them. Mm -hmm. They really hate it that someone comes from the outside, and even me as a son of Dresden going back to my parents or wherever after nine years and say, hey guys, what do you do? And it is the don't tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to pick up on one word that you used, Johannes. You talked about the elites, the elites in, in Eastern Germany and what role they play in all this. And I, I found a, a very interesting fact when I was reading up for the, on, the, on the story that uh, only 20% of senior management in the East are actually from the East. That means 80% are not. Yeah? That's insupportable. This is part of that victimhood narrative that preceded the refugee crisis because, remember, from their point of view, the first invaders were the Vessis mm -hmm. that made the, the, the Easterners second-class citizens in their own new country. And now a new class of outsiders comes in, which... And, you know, um, Kurt Biedenkopf, who was, who was a Westerner who was for a long time premier of Saxony, once said this in a, in a, to a group that I was part of that even in American history, it was always the second to last immigrant group that was most virulently against the last or the most mm -hmm. recent. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, they feel that they're immigrants into their new country, even though they never moved. And that's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And now there are new arrivals and they let it out on them. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a problem with how this all feeds into the, de the, the great debate about democracy. I've got a, a, an Eastern German sociologist, Raj Kohn Morgan, put it like this. It's a very interesting quote. East Germans see themselves as unrepresented in their institutions. As a result, they don't identify with those institutions. And it's democracy that suffers. It certainly is. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, it's a problem if a minority does not accept the choices of the majority anymore and I believe that these people out on the streets in Dresden really are part of a however tiny minority and we still see though the support for Merkel is declining we still see um, some sort of general agreement that for a social democratic or conservative or at least the mainstream party regime in Germany. Mm. And um, so I do think it's it's many different factors that play into the situation we see right now and a certain discontent with mm, democracy as we know it, as the rule of the majority is part of it. Mm. Do you understand the anger of those people who go out on the streets and say, we are underrepresented, we are not represented? Well, this would be a... <clears throat> would be a great quote if they were screaming, we are not represented. <laughs> this is a starting point for, yeah, yeah. for a brilliant uh, new way to go. But they say, Volksverbieter, you're not one of us. You're betraying the people. Mm. I mean, you have to really repeat that. You are betraying the people. We are the people and you're betraying us. Um, I do have some understanding for why they feel that way. Mm. And... Um, I'm thinking of what could, be, what could be done. And I mean, there's a Fulbright bro program. We're sending journalists, bright people from one continent to the other to learn and to get, it, get to know each other. Well, we should send maybe some people from the west to the east and from the east to the west, maybe have some people that were screaming Volksverräter, send them to the Deutsche Bundestag, join a parliamentarian for a week and see how difficult it is <laughs> to find a compromise. I mean something that actually exposes at least a couple people mm -hmm. to the difficult me mechanics of democracy. Mm -hmm. Andreas, one Berlin journalist, Marcus Decker, commenting on all this, said two countries in one. Is that right? That sounds like two countries is one system. I used to live in Hong Kong. <laughs> no, two systems, one country. Um, I think so. Personally, I mean, I was born in... In America, I'm American, but with German parents, and I moved to Germany four years ago um, uh, after a childhood where I spent a few years in West Germany. So I thought I knew Germany, I thought I knew German culture, and I have to say, what I discovered, or when I discovered when I go to the eastern parts, is really surprisingly alien to me, as I said earlier. Mm. So I, I, I absolutely sympathize with them. I think it is two countries in, in one mm. for the time being. 
One commentator I read said people in Germany still have a wall in their head after all these years. Do you have a wall in your head, Anna? <laughs> no, I've... Uh, <laughs> no, no, least, she says, no. <laughs> not, not, not that I know of. Um, uh, and I don't think it's, it's what rings wrong uh, to me with two countries in one is um, that it looks like it's not our com problem as Westerners or as inhabitants of the capital, the political capital. And, and that is just wrong. It's, uh, it's a problem we all have and we should all tackle and not just the people of Dresden. Johannes, how divided is Germany? One sentence. Below the surface, the surface it still is, but there's a lot we can do about it. Okay. Thanks very much for your input, all three of you, your insights. I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I have. If you have, then come back next week. Until then, bye-bye. Cheers. -bye. <laughs>